You got loads you want to talk about. No, no, I, I just. No, no, no. That's literally <laughs> what you just said. I've got loads. I've got loads. <laughs> you making notes? Um, uh, mate, well, to be fair, shit loads happened since you last came up. Shit loads happened. Yeah. So. Was the the helicopter jump the world record was after our last interview, wasn't it? Um, I think it was. Yeah. I haven't interviewed you since. No, yeah, we and have. you were saying that was twenty twenty. Yeah, we've done a H hour since then. Oh, we helicopter have. One. Yeah. We have. You came to the studio up in Warwick. Mm. Um, however, after that, you went to Ukraine. Yeah. What's the jam? Well, wow, it was. Um, yeah, that was a funny old one. That kicked off, and everyone was getting upset about it, and. I'd, you know, I was a bit. I thought, well, I've got a couple of months off, and um, I, I met this lad. You know what people, normal people, think when they got a couple of months off? What? I'll have some downtime. Maybe I'll go on a holiday. <laughs> well, I'd never been. <laughs> you to don't Ukraine. think I'd uh, go to Ukraine? Yeah, I'd never been. So I thought I'll go and, go and see what, I can, and see, have a look. Never yeah. been. What's well, it like this time of year? What's going on? Well, I, so I we went literally during um, so I had the invasion and and we were there, you know, shortly at that time, and uh, yeah, so. I met this lad, Jack Ross, um, mega lad, and uh, he, he wanted to do something. He, he wanted to join the military at the time, and or do make a change or do something. And he found out we talked about Ukraine, and um, it was kicking off. And I said, oh, we could go out there and do something. And he just went, "Yep, yeah, all right." And he was driven. He was because I was a bit, you know, work was coming in or work was stopping, and I was a little wishy washy. But he was determined, so he bought a van. He bought a van and he got chatting to some um, lads in, it in Poland and things like that. And obviously, you know, we, we always know lads on the ground or things like that. So it's, I knew a few people around. And um, he said, right, I've got a van. Um, we're going to go out there. And I said, no dramas. So we jumped in the van. But he didn't have driving license. He can't drive. <laughs> so I, so I, um, we had a, a mate help us drive to the border, to uh, the the Ukraine border in Poland and uh, there we picked up this English lad who, who'd done a bit in Ukraine a few years before as like a, an English teacher and stuff like that and then uh, he came as an interpreter <laughs> and he was crap like he was a really good guy and all them but his Ukraine was terrible he wasn't, he wasn't fluent in Ukraine mate fluent. he was awful I was laughing like, like at first like is this a joke and then I started flapping a little bit thinking Christ, if we get a checkpoint and he says the wrong thing or this, that, and the other, I'm thinking, oh. So I flapped a little bit, like thinking, oh, God. But no, he, he was a good lad. And um, so the three of us just drove, we drove over the border and um, we, we made initial contact in the old western side of Lviv. With who? And, well, we, we got to this uh, hospital. So I, I had a mate on the ground, uh, Leighton Clark. Um, mega bloke he's a Welsh as well South Wales what is it about these South Wales boys I'm drawn to but anyway he's a mega bloke and he really squared me away with a lot of in and stuff and, and he was great and then he hooked us up at this um, children's hospital in Lviv and there you know like the doctors and all them they were really helpful to us but no one was going to Kiev no one from Lviv to Kiev it's basically like, it's probably the length of England you know Lviv to Kiev and no one was taking that route. So we said, oh, you know, bollocks, let's have a go. And we went and we got through. So you wanted to get to Kiev? We wanted to get to Kiev, yeah. And um, we got to take supplies and, you know, help people out where we can. And, and, you know, we wanted to help people with special needs, things like that, you know, because obviously a war zone, there's a lot of people that don't want to be there, elderly, vulnerable, you know, people with special needs as such, you know, they, they need help. So yeah, so we got to Kiev and, and when we got there, the place was just, a, it was a ghost town with barriers everywhere and, you know, you driving down the road and we see like the old people doing the old prayer sign to us, like, wee, you know, like, because um, we got a big big cross on the old van and Ukraine flags and you know, a, bit of, a bit of stuff written on the side of the van and yeah, we, we took in some supplies and stuff and when we got there, it was such a good moment and the, the the Ukrainians they were just saying that the British were first to help they, the Brit the second they needed help they said the Brits were just there and they were helping you know and it was great you'd get there and you'd you know like the places you'd see these bomb places or 
you know, vehicles sprayed up or, or whatever. And so we were going around Kiev a little bit, and then we got um, we found this little church, and this bloke, this. Uh, uh, so sorry, sorry. So so when you were driving around, you literally just look into opportunistically see people who needed help. Well, yeah. So we had loads of supplies and stuff, and we like what, like what? Well, you know, like food, basic food supplies, basic first aid supplies, bandages, things like that. You know, water, water purification stuff. Do you know what I mean? So we would, you know, we'd help them. We're like, oh, your buggers, how are you getting on? And I'd be, oh. You know, we had there was one woman crying. Oh, my, my son was gardening in the front garden. The Russian drove past and just shot him dead. And, you know, here's the fish that he caught. And there's like, she's giving us the fish. We're like, no, we're here to help you, you lunatic. Like, trying to help her. And, you know, just nice things, really. Um, and then, so we were, we were bumming about there. And, like, you'd see the place. And it was just like, it was tragic, mate. It was really sad because people were thinking, <coughs> when you think of these countries, you think of, like, African mud huts or... You know, they're not living like they're normal people are living like us. You know what I mean? They got they got nicer houses than us. You know, like nice house, nice car, business, whatever, clothes. And these people just came through and just massacred it, smashed it up. And it was like, mate, this is horrible. You know, we got to help the buggers. And then, so we we helped out around there for a bit, and then. We thought, right, so we met this church going lot, and uh, they were dead nice, and we would go out to these villages out of Kiev that had really suffered, and we'd go and help, helping a lot of them. You know, there was an area called uh, Butcher, and they, they had, had like a, um, a massacre going on there. Like, loads of civilians had just been killed. How? Oh, why? The, uh, the Russians come through, and these areas, they were like nice suburbs. So imagine Kiev is London, and these were like suburbs, you know, uh, you know um, I don't know your Guildfords and your places like that do you know what I mean you're woke in your Guildfords and, and and they were just absolutely ruined um, and, and yeah you know because people were good life and they were saying what they were doing is having young feral Russians come through you know that were just angry and they were just you know just going mad on the place and the, th the thing is it was sad because some of the some of the you know like the Russians and them as well. Uh, you, you you don't feel like ah oh, you you lot are horrible this and that. these young lads you could tell had different sides of the stories and what was going on. So it was it was. How really, did you tell? Well, um, it was just from from. It's hard to explain. But it, it what were the stories? What you, what, so what so like cause, you know the Russians thought that the Ukrainians were coming in to attack and this that and the other and all that when really they were just living doing their thing um in their main areas they, they they weren't expecting russians and things like that and russians were getting there like hang on a minute what's going on here and i think uh, you know i think that lead that they should have been on was very long um so instead the of keeping them yeah so instead of keeping the discipline you know like <laughs> i remember going to an area and i was in this wood block and the Russians had just literally, I don't know, they'd, I think they'd left like the, that night and we were there like the next day. So we were dead close. And um, like, and then the foxholes and, you know, digging in and all that. So they'd been there a little while and they were just on a woodblock, just outside this village. And they would go in the village to get supplies and all them to make, and then get back out. And you see their ration packs, you see they're miserable and stagging on and all that. They're doing all the standard stuff. And then they would get in the village, you know, get some supplies, do whatever they want to do and get back, you know, chocolates, booze and all that. And then, and then they were moving off. Um, so yeah. And, and then, well, anyway, from there, like I said, we met this church going lot and they were doing these bits, but then we wanted to go further and we went all the way to the uh, Russian border on the east, uh, Kharkiv. And um, that was just, you know, bombs going off and, and, you know, like there's certain lines where there were snipers and, all sorts going at basically Russia stagging on all the time to check any movement. So um, yeah, that was that was a bit more like bloody hell. But the thing is, they were in Kharkiv. It was a bit more Kiev and places like that. It was a shock. Yeah, they've been attacked. It was like, oh my god, what's going on here? But then Kharkiv was probably the length of England again to get to the border, and we got there, and and they were used to the war. They were used to the fighting. They were used to what was going on. Obviously, it was a bit heavier than usual, um, but they were used to it. You know, they were people of war. You know, they were people of conflict. Um, 
so yeah obviously they were you know it was a sad time for them but it wasn't anything too new from whereas the rest of the country it was like bloody hell we've been attacked so, mm. yeah. when you were in that wood block mm. where, uh, where the old Russian position not the old the, the, yeah. the recently yeah. um, vacated Russian positions were so did they leave, was there like military kit that they left behind and rubbish and stuff like that, that they, what, what was it like compared to what we had when we were serving well, so... You Russian mentioned rat packs, packs yeah, yeah, yeah. similar. You know, like, so you get a box, you know, it was similar, you know, and the rations in there... All in the bag and yeah, shit. Or yeah, or you, not, not our ration packs now. Like when we joined 20, 20 years ago, whatever, you know, it was that sort of, that sort of ration, you know, your biscuit browns, your biscuit fruit, that, you know, standard, you know, like, it, it was all, all that. And, um, yeah, they, they actually dug some good trenches they had some good good tunnels some good trenches and things like that obviously we had to be careful because um, we were just conscious of traps as well you know like they might have left there they weren't thankfully and stuff but there were a lot of things like um, all of a sudden you'd be driving down where they'd exited from and you'd see where the Ukrainians had attacked and it was just like tanks and just wagons obliterated Um, you know I remember going up to one tank and just like being in it and it was like Christ, this could be able to move, you know, like we could drive this around and like just having a look around in it and having a little play or like there was nothing wrong with the it. kit not really, no. It was just like yeah, I know, it was a bit whoa, hello, what's going on here? Um take a few souvenirs from this. <laughs> you know, it was a bit yeah, it was a bit nuts like. But um yeah, they did get they did get uh, smashed a bit as well. But it wasn't so a good example, like I'm from Portsmouth, um and between Portsmouth and London, we've got this main motorway called the, the A, A3. So for yourself, you know, London and Colchester, you've got the A12, right? Now imagine they're going from Colchester to London, the Russians, and on their way, they see Chelmsford. Oh, it's Chelmsford. Let's stop off. And they've driven to Chelmsford, and there's a little sports centre and all that, and they've driven their tank all around it and just sprayed it. Brrr. All, all over and just you know dumb donuts in their tanks and just trash the place and there's a bit oh there's a building boom and just whacked it just actually just you know hit, hit it really? with a bomb yeah no honestly yeah handle it yeah and it was so sad honestly it was it was just like the these lovely areas and stuff had just been smashed for like, and, and you could see you could you could visualize you can see it I remember I walked in and saw where this tank had been or like, like where it had been and where it had gone and what they'd done and what they'd hit and and just because we were so you know we were on the aftermath and it was just mate it was it was really sad and then like you would just see the people just like oh they were really yesterday and look what they've done and it was like mate look like, it's a bit of past. You know, I reckon they were taking pot shots at them. I'm not excusing it. I'm Who? not excusing the Russian What, the, the Ukrainians? Yeah, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do is trying mm. to frame a unit, getting yeah. about, and they yeah. decide to go and waste their time doing that and brass and shit up. Right. I can imagine it like on an individual infantry soldier level. Yeah. Because you see fucking idiots do that. Yeah, yeah you But do. on a unit, armor yeah. unit level, it's it, like, fucking hell, man. Mate, I'm 100% with you. Mm. Yeah, I am. But then uh, I went there and I saw it from a set and the devastation they caused the unnecessary damage you know mate it was just like unreal and then um, we were lucky enough to um, you know we aided a few soldiers at the time as well like like you know their military were welcoming us and all them and we you know we did a little bit of uh, you know helping with them and it was just yeah they would just show us where, you know, where they'd been. And, you know, like one of the lads says, oh, Britain and the end law, thanks very much. And I was here, popped out, and then you'd see the tank they blasted. And the end law? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, mate. What were they like, the soldiers that you met, the Ukrainian soldiers? Determined. Really determined. And I could see why. You know, like, you imagine now, you know, just, I know it's hard to believe because of where we live and how we live. Imagine just a country came to us now and said, how would you be? Mm. No matter how old you are, no matter what you feel, do you think you care about your work? Mm. You'd be driven, wouldn't you? And you'd go for it. And that's what they were like. And, and it was fair play to them. You know, don't get me wrong, in Kiev, when we turned up, it was a ghost town. It was fair. But then you'd go to a spot and there'd be a nice restaurant. There'd be a nice restaurant and there'd be 
a strapping fighting age male serving you as a waiter and I'd be like oi Dinlo what are you doing here get out like, go, and, go and grab an AK go and sort, you know what I mean what are you doing here do you know what I mean it was like bloody hell what's going on so yeah it was um, not what was uh, did you get much of an insight to be able to look at or get a handle on the the comparative casualty rates between the Russians and the Ukrainians anecdotally obviously because he's used one man on the ground there but I I, d- I don't think the Geneva Convention was followed <laughs> I'm going to agree with you yeah. I'm going to I'm going to agree with you yeah. go on what leads you to say that I just, well I don't, <sighs> no I, d- I really don't and um, yeah why was, neither um, definitely definitely not by by, by either no and I feel the whole thing is sad the whole thing is really sad because is it the West flexing themselves through Ukraine to Putin is it you know like it's it's one possibility uh, well you know like all I all I don't care about any of that all I cared about was the people that didn't want to be there you know it was it was a bit of closure for me really it was a bit of um you know we we gone to places and we smashed places up and things you know like how about we go there now and don't do bad shit how about we go there and do some good shit you know and i can remember just like going in and these people were desperate much and you're going in there and you're you're giving them supplies and and you know just just giving them a hug and letting them cry out for five minutes you know what i mean it was just like you know and just to let them know that the rest of the world is thinking about them during this time you know like that was a good that was a good thing as well you know it does feel to me like the the conflict has been perpetuated longer than needs to go on and it feels to me like the west is doing that mate it's I don't know what people's end goals are I don't know their objectives and all that all I know is that normal people are suffering and it's not nice this is this is part of the problem isn't mm. it it's like um, I think it's a common thing where you get governments trying to get public uh, uh, trying to win over public opinion and carry on X, Y or Z initiative in this case it's support for the war in Ukraine and the problem is they're very clever in that they don't specify what their end goal is so right now it's you know right now we know it's not a peace deal we know they didn't want that from early on they being the west you know there's it's well documented about boris going in and persuading zelensky not to enter into a peace deal with uh, a ceasefire deal with putin what was that three four years ago about the time you oh, were we, there. we were out there, there we when, go, yeah. when johnson was there yeah. and and so what is it now it's uh it's russia have to be defeated or whatever this they're, they're saying at the moment but it, you need to be more granular that what are we talking about does that mean that we're getting we're kicking russia completely out of ukraine and back in and the whole of ukraine remains ukrainian as it was before the conflict started because i don't think that's realistic uh, is it going to be is it going to be overthrow putin is it going to how long does it go on for does that mean we're going to put boots in the ground boots on the ground in ukraine they're not being specific with it and i think if they were if they tried to be specific with it we would be the public would be much harder saying uh ceasefire please because what you're proposing is mental yeah yeah, you know what I mean. Totally. I, I don't see how Ukraine can be can kick Russia out completely without Western boots on the ground, conventional forces on the ground in Ukraine to support them. Yeah, I just and I don't want that either. I just don't understand how they can't just agree. You know, like just come on, just get along. <laughs> you know, it's just so. You know, like oh, you want that ten miles of land? Yeah, all right, then you keep that we'll just come back here a little bit this principle and and all that sort of stuff i just i just just let it go come on yeah it's a um, person it's the problem is that the whole area it's much, much more nuanced and complex than um what uh, what is being made out by governments and by media in that you know that that area even in the last 20 20 years before this conflict started it was all up in the air up for debate over who was going to control it who was not you know not just ukraine but belarus and the other places around it you know as recently as 2014 russia was under 
Mm. Russia was, uh, as recent as 2014, Ukraine was, you know, governed in inverted commas by Russia. And, you know, that, and the way it came about that they were no longer after 2014, that wasn't through war. And through peaceful chatting, discussing means. Now, it doesn't take away from the fact that Putin's the one that invaded. Naughty, naughty boy. Well, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's all, it's all upsetting, like, but. How do you I, change I, it? How do you stop it? Well, just, well, just. Um, put Putin in a boxing ring. <laughs> With who? Oh, Zelensky. I don't know. Yeah, yeah with Klitschko. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, yeah, Klitschko, yeah. I don't think Zelensky would win against Putin. Putin. Putin seems to me like he can handle himself much more than Zelensky. And Zelensky's just a cokehead, isn't he, at the minute? I think Zelensky's not interested in any kind of scrapping like that. No, yeah. he wouldn't get out of his polo shirt. No, I am. Um, but I was very... You could, the Ukraine trip I was very proud very proud of like you know we did good we did some good stuff nice stuff you know a couple of lads in a transit van <laughs> bombing around you know we up the Belarus or wherever we went all over and just like yeah we just we did good stuff and yeah helped a lot of people so yeah that was good that's good mate that's mm. good how many of you were there? Uh, well there was three of us the start me Jack and Ricky the translator and then <laughs> Yeah, and then obviously that the little kid, they've come back and, and they've been going out there ever since and they've built up a... They're uh, still going, are they? Yeah, yeah, the Vans, Vans Without Borders, they're called, and they built up a good little charity base and they go out there and they deliver even vehicles and stuff like that. They've just no end to help. Vans Without Border guys, yeah, really good. Yeah, so from that initial trip, so that initial trip was just like, you know, seeing how it all was and where we can go and, and things like that. And and the boys on the ground, you know, they, they help me out. Um, yeah, nice one. This. So you're thinking about getting back involved? Nah, I, um, nah. I that was really nice what I did. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I was really, I was a hero. No, <laughs> no, um, no. I I just no. It was it was it was really nice that trip. It was really helpful. And yeah, I I just it's such a big long process. This one that bit when they needed help you know where they needed help that was enough for me mm. you know like now this this what they're doing now it's just like yeah I what did you mean when you said that trip was closure for you and then you alluded to um, that kind of stuff well yeah you know because obviously you have some hang ups before that did you um not well not you say hang ups so I, you know go to Afghanistan you know, I meet a little kid that's probably never seen a Westerner, shake their hand, oh, mate, I'm a pen and paper or a sweet or something, nice one, and then flatten his village, you know? It's a bit... I think you're... I think you're mm. oversimplifying that. Well, you remember Nalzad? When yeah. Right there? Yeah. What do we do to Nalzad? Um, well... We were up I there. do recall oh, the first time that, I went in there and the second time no the first time I went in there yeah on that compared hill to the second time I went in a couple of months back mm. the place was decimated between those two points yeah. but that was through fighting with the Taliban as opposed to yeah. let's just flatten this place no I, no no, no. I, I know we were, we were doing it but we we went for it didn't we didn't hold back mm. yeah and I just feel you know, there would have been a lot of people there that didn't want to be there. Do you agree? He knows that. Yeah. Well, they left, didn't they? Well, no. So we we were there on the hill. Yeah. Taliban. Oh, the first place. time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're smashing the place, aren't we? There would have been a lot of people there that didn't want to be there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly that. So I'm just trying to make it a little better. <laughs> You know, I'm just trying to do some nice stuff or, or you know, just, just trying to make it nice, you know. Yeah, I got just, it. Yeah. I think having kids really, um, I think, shook me up a bit, you know. In what way? In the sense of, I reckon, you know, well, we're going to get deep now, are you ready? Okay, so you imagine the Germans, right, the young soldiers that were at Auschwitz or, or doing atrocities and things like that, but yet they felt they were doing good, yeah? 
They did, didn't they? They believed they were doing good. There's no, there's no argument, is there? Are you comparing me to a Nazi? Not you, but, but <laughs> no, no, but like, not yeah, yeah. But myself, I feel myself at that point in the military as I was. I felt, uh, you know, if I was told enough or believed in that, you know, how we get through our training. Right, you believe you're an airborne soldier. You're this, that, you know, you think that drive and that belief. Do you think maybe they could have twisted us if there was that sort of thing? No kids, no single boy like that. Could we have been those types of soldiers doing that sort of stuff? Oh, absolutely. Could we? Exactly. If you get the wrong, you get the, you know, you. Well, look at look at now, right? All it takes is not now. All it, we've got a new government come in, right? Um, all it takes is for a new government to come in, and they and they're someone like a Hitler to be at the top and to be very good at manipulating the public, very good at manipulating people, very good at very good at being able to organise people to do bad things, right? And then everyone gets on board. There's a fine line, like from our perspective, you and I. When we went to these places, be it Northern Ireland, Iraq, or Afghanistan, we serve, you and I serve in pretty much the same places, right? It was all. This is, I, I always want to think of serving and think of things like you're saying, or there's accusations of British soldiers are cold blooded killers and murderers severely. And I, and I think, no, you don't understand how rigidly rules of engagement is drilled into us. You don't understand how rigidly. Um, you know all of the process and thoughts that go into decision making before you pull the trigger is drilled into us you don't understand how how um how rigidly we are come down on with punishment most of the time in most circumstances if we unnecessarily cause collateral damage be that you know structural building whatever destroying resources food or destroying people mm. that don't need to be destroyed you know we're hammered with it you know there's a fine line between having those control measures in place you can strip those away slightly and then convince people that this whole country needs to die mm. and all of a sudden you've got as you were saying there we're yeah. doing very 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 bad things and you and i mean correct me if i'm wrong here but you know i saw a handful of instances of things being done incorrectly when I was in uh, Afghanistan I don't remember I don't remember in Iraq I mean things that you should get disciplined for on an operation you should not have done that and every single time barring one incident I saw the perpetrators which is a British soldier getting disciplined for it you know properly disciplined for it in the way they should pulled up not being allowed to get away with it hmm well, and that's the case across the board now. Yeah, some, do you get some instances yeah. where it's not the case? You know, sometimes you can't have it, you can't have it perfect all the time. But I don't know. Is that is that marry up with your experience or not? Well, no, no, it totally is. But but my point is back with the kids in sense of that. So like the German soldiers and all that, and I think how we were in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, there wouldn't been in a lot for me. You know, I was so. There was nothing to stop it. If you you said that they're in there, we're going in there. That's what we do. That was me. I was I was focused. I was going, and there would be nothing stopping me. You know, unless I was killed. You know, there would have nothing stopping me going. And I think, wow, that's quite strong. And now I think, now I've got the kids, and I've got the opinion I've got, and how we are. I think, oh, you know, like, thank God there wasn't that government. Exactly what you just said. Thank God there wasn't that thing. You know, you know. The, we were doing good stuff and we did do good but if there was bad i could have been that person as well doing the bad stuff and that's what and then obviously i've got the kids and that's what shook me up a bit so that's what i'm trying to say yeah there's levels of the, the thing is you mentioned about a geneva convention just now and i can see how that that would go completely out the window in some circumstances there are you know stalingrad level stalingrad level levels of conflict actual you know war world war for example you know your country getting invaded and the geneva convention can be carried so far but if if you are up against it you know real hard up against it and you are fighting for your survival 
you, your village, your country, <laughs> and the opposition, the enemy, are not following the Geneva Convention, which is making it extremely difficult to fight them in a fair fight, right? I can see why you wouldn't do it. You know, if you think back to, um, you think back to, I'll give an example, right? Vietnam, uh, in fact, pre-Vietnam, this is French Foreign Legion. No, yeah, the French Foreign Legion, uh, the, the Devil's Guard, you ever read the book, The Devil's Guard? I've heard of it, yeah. Um, you not read it? Wow. Right, so anyway, Devil's Guard is a great book. But it gives an example, and they have this, this, um, this uh, legion, French legion, which basically was made up of, <laughs> it was made up of Germans who had fled Germany, right, after the war, to get away from being captured by the huh? Allies, fled Germany, and, they end, and a lot of them ended up going to France, and they ended up joining the French Foreign Legion. And they'd be like, hmm, right, who are you, Mr. German? Oh, yeah, I was just a farmer during the war. Just a farmer. That's it. So I'm here to uh, come and, you know, join the French Foreign Legion. I want a new start in life. And I'm happy to go to Indochina and fight against the communists or whatever the fuck it was. And uh, it was the communists, wasn't it? Yeah. And uh, they'd be like, okay, right, go into this. We're going to create a battalion for all you Germans. And it was a German battalion. You've got to read the book. It was a German, this is legit, German battalion. They put them all in there. They were like, they would get all the shitty tasks. They're like the suicide mission, yeah. the real high risk stuff. They go, the, 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 the French would be like, send the Germans. <laughs> send the fucking yeah. Germans. But as a result, the Germans didn't give a shit. Yeah. Because when they went into these missions, it was, they knew they were on their ass. They're like, fuck. One example of one of the things they did, going back to my point about the Geneva Convention, there was a, there was a, a French unit it may have been a foreign legion unit it was a French unit I stuck isolated somewhere in the jungle in Indochina they were running out of food they were running out of water they were running out of uh, ammo and they were just casually racking up and the French couldn't get to them because the road there through the jungle was just every time they tried to get through there the convoy would get smashed so they went right <laughs> get the Germans yeah. this sounds like a job for the Germans they get the German legion in and they go right you're going to get there just fucking get there anywhere you can go and resupply these guys and get them out if you can the Germans went through and as they started the first village they got to because the village is along the road the first village they got to they got some of the locals they strapped them to the sides of the wagons they strapped the locals to the sides of the wagons and on uh tannoy like loudspeakers from the wagons as they drove through they were saying don't bother attacking us if you try and shoot us try and ambush us you're going to kill your own people they get to the next village get the old villages off they strap the new villages on and they just drive through and they go all the way to the isolated unit like that and there's the only way it was the only mission through there that was successful and they managed to save the isolated outpost well outside the remit of the geneva convention you know what i mean yeah. but in extremis they managed to achieve the aim i can see how it comes about i can see how it comes about you know I'm not advocating for that. No. But again, you look at look at Israel Palestine. Mm. You know, that area is the birth of terrorism. It's not the birth of terrorism because it's uh, that's how I describe it, the birth of terrorism. It's not the uh, it's the birth it's the it's where suicide the suicide bombers first came about, I think, was West Bank under the Israeli occupation. Now that situation didn't come about because someone was sitting down, Yasser Arafat was sitting there one day and uh, I mean, yeah, terrorism sounds like a great idea. Suicide bombers sound like a great idea. It's not how it came about because all of the other options that they saw available to them in terms of, right, let's try and keep our land just disappeared. <laughs> Gone over time. Eroded over time. You get more and more you get more and more um, frantic. You get more and more what's the word? Like at your wits end. You get more and more willing to do things that are batshit crazy. Batshit crazy. You know? I'm not advocating for fucking terrorism, by the way, or suicide bombers. So I can just see how it escalates to that point. No card alpha there. No card alpha. <laughs> Again, escalation yeah. of force. Something yeah. that's drilled into us. <laughs> yeah. Only use just as much force as you need to to win the battle. Yeah. Now, definitely Afghanistan. <laughs> definitely in Afghan. That wasn't the case all the time. You know? yeah. But, um... It's complicated, mate. Huh? War is complicated. What you want to hope is that most most of the people, like if you, if I was going to fight against an enemy, I would like to think 
they're kind of the same mindset as us. Okay, <laughs> bit of empathy. Let's adhere to the Geneva Convention. Let's try and minimize civilian <laughs> casualties. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I'm yet to fight an enemy like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not at me. No. Well, I uh, well. I, hopefully my um, well like I said my, my son has just joined up so yeah hopefully he's going to have a bit of a different time he's uh, he's just finishing Harrogate so yeah or August he finishes so yeah joining the Reg no <laughs> no I, I love blue I absolutely love blue he loves red that's him no he's uh, he's a pest for weapon systems and things like that he's going in the Royal Armoured Corps uh, huh. Yeah, uh, not the. Sorry, he's going to kill me for that. Royal Tank Regiment. Royal Tank Regiment. RTR. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, where we are at the minute yeah. is owned by Bag Simmons Royal Tank Regiment. He was in the Royal Tank. Yeah, he's an RTR. RTR. Is officer, he? Yeah, he was in. When did you get out? Were you in? Were you? Uh, oh, wait, I got out. Ah, right. No, he was so he was on a tour with Three Para on the third one we did in 2010. Yeah. Did, did he take a lot of stick? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it was Italian yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, well, well, little, yeah. So, little Johnny will be at Bovington, and then uh, uh, Tidworth, Salisbury. So, yeah. What's the feeling like that your boy's joining up? Oh, he's brilliant. He's uh, he's changed so well. He's, he's phys- physically, mentally, he's fantastic, lad. Yeah, it's been the best. I, I pros, brilliant. I, I haven't seen a con yet. He's done so well. I'm so proud of him. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't see a bad thing at the moment. <laughs> what about um, what do you think the next do you, have you thought about does it make you think about what the next conflict's going to be what well, the next like significant action for the British military is going to be well he, they're talking about the Challenger 3 tank coming out and stuff like that and hopefully he gets trained up on that and you know he does well and, and if we send challenges out to Ukraine you know hopefully you know it will advise the Ukrainians on how to draw or this that you know how to operate them and hopefully, fingers crossed, that's as close as he gets. You know, but um, but yeah, he's well, he's loving life, and anyway, well, his section commander's a good three power lad. <laughs> yeah, oh, really. Yeah, I don't know his first name, Gagan. Gagan, he's called. It might be Daryl Gagan. Okay. Anyway, but yeah, so yeah, he uh, I owe him a pint. He's sort of my boy right out. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, that's cool. Would you um? Would you go back and do all your service all over again? Oh, it, yeah, my, my, it was my, it was my apprenticeship. Yeah, it's made me well. my apprenticeship. It was, yeah, no. yeah. I, I, I needed it. Yeah, I needed it. I need, I needed the fizz. I needed to get slapped. I needed to get told where I was and what to do. And yeah. why? Who were you before you joined up? I was just an angry boy. Just, uh, you know, like, um, wanted, it was driven, wanted adventure, wanted to be the best, wanted to, I don't know, you know, do it all. And, you know, you read the books and, you know, like the, you know, I had a book on the embassy and, st- you know, reigning embassy and stuff like that. And just like, ah, you know, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so then I went and did my time, did my bit and, yeah, loved it, left it. And that was enough. It was good for me. Do you think you would have? Um, do you think you'd have ended up down the path of uh, you know, like stunt safety and doing your own stunt oriented challenges and uh, things like going out to Ukraine if you hadn't have served? Do you think you would have been that uh, kind of person anyway? Possibly because uh, I've got an ego. <laughs> oh God! Oh yeah. Oh. What's the ego? Got to do with? I don't like people doing one up on me. I like to be the. I like to be the top boy. So was that a motivation for going to Ukraine? It's just, just um, no, I wouldn't say that was a motivation for Ukraine. No, I'd say the motivation for Ukraine was that it was conveniently the right time, but it was like I said, a bit of closure, like like going there and doing the good. It made selfishly, it made me feel really good. You know, like like I didn't do it to go out and just man, I genuinely wanted to help. You know, I did want to help people and do bits for them but but in, in on the flip side it really helped me and it was nice and, and yeah so yeah that, you don't strike me as someone that's ego driven I've got an ego mate yeah I, I like yeah well, are, you, are you confusing ego with competitiveness though um, I'm very competitive oh I'm super competitive and um, but no in the sense of well I've just been turned down by Red Bull again 
they, they turn me down all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, this one, um, I've got a big one. Yeah, if anyone's listening and you want to, you know, help fund this, you know, you get in touch. Um, I want three records in one. It's it's the world's highest death dive, the world's highest dive, and it's the world's highest jump all, all rolled into one. What, a death dive? What's a death dive? Uh, it's when you f- jump out like a like a spread eagle and then you fold in half like you're going to and belly you go, flop. yeah and then you go head and feet first in I've water. seen it the yeah. last second isn't it yeah. you you get out of the belly flop position yeah. and go into like a that, weird pike kind one, of position yeah. right yeah. so how high we got to, would that have to be well the current death dive is about 40 40 metres the, the world's highest dive now a dive just constitutes as you know it can be feet first but it means your body has to rotate from the platform you know like your head needs to be oh what you know so if you just jump off as a pencil that's a jump you know okay, so a dive right. you, your body has to orientate that means slightly like it needs to be like a position change yeah I didn't and know then, that yeah okay. and then the highest jump so the highest uh, death dive is 40 meters the highest dive is around 50 and the highest jump into water is 58 meters why do I I have thought it would have been much higher than that um well why is that the limit at the minute 58 meters is the highest jump because it, it, it if mate if you land wrong or you're not you know you're not in the right place it ruins you but if the higher up you jump right I'm a moron <laughs> you know more than me but okay. surely if the high up, right, put, taking the speed of impact aside, yeah. right? But the higher up you jump from, the more time you've got into, to get into a stable position. Um, if you've got great aerial awareness and body control, you know, if you've gone slightly too fast with your head, for example, you can over rotate <clears throat> and you might not be able to get that rotation back. Um, you know, 10 meter board, the swimming pool, you hit the water at about 35 mile an hour. You do a Red Bull cliff diving, you know, you're jumping at about 80, 90 foot, you're hitting the water at about 55 mile an hour. You know what I mean? When I hit the water, I was going about, in, you know, I, I was at about 140 foot. I, I hit the water at about, I think it was 75 mile an hour. And then, yeah, so, so that was 140 foot. I want to go up to 200 foot. So that's, you know, it's another 60 foot. Um, we're going to be getting, you know, probably near the 80 mile, well, 80 mile an hour plus maybe. How many metres? Uh, 60 metres. So what was the pitch to Red Bull? Um, <laughs> I've been on total wipeout. Come on, point to me. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, no. Um, I did this really good... good you, you've been in conversation with them for a while or a bunch oh, of different things, mate, right? Loads of times, yeah. I, I did this really good pitch with them, right? And... Uh, I was going to do this little, like, program with them, you know. They had a really, um, so they got a fella called uh, Danny McCaskill who rides mountain bikes. He's a Scottish boy. And, uh, he, you know, he'll ride across a tennis net on his bike or he'll do... He know, hasn't done that. Yeah, no. yeah. He does all sorts of crazy the stuff. The top of a tennis uh, net. net. Yeah, rides his BM- uh, mountain bike across it. Nice yeah. and skill. Oh, he's fantastic, mate. He's very talented man very good and you know, there's all these sorts of jumps you know the height of this room it'll bounce down from on his bike yeah look how high it is oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing and he's on a mountain bike yeah he's very very talented very good and then um, he did this thing for YouTube where he did this stunts and it was a wind turbine and uh, I'll put him out on the you know the wind turbine blades mm-hmm. I'll put him on the I so saw I rigged it all and he got out on a turbine blade on his mountain bike and he's he I rode, take it the blade wasn't turning. No 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 yeah no it was fixed place. So he, but he rode his bike it. out, yeah. And I I was the you know, I rigged out for him. And uh, we had a little chat about fear. You know, what do we do what do you do about fear when you come to it? And I was saying, Ah, oh, well I like to breathe a lot, you know, take lots of deep breaths and you know, when we were in the Chinook or whatever, you you know, we'd all be you know, deep breaths and calming ourselves and ready for the chaos in front and you know, if I come to a jump, a deep breath, you know, a bit like Wim Hof type stuff, you know, deep breath and really feeling the energy and then going for it. He liked to sing a song. He'd go like, oh yeah, I like to sing a song, you know, like whatever it is. And then I get to a certain part and I go. <laughs> and then he's going, oh yeah, but I like this a certain part of the song and, you know, uh, you know, I might need to change the song. Anyway, we're chatting away. 
And so he was a bloke I was going to meet before my jump during the training. There's another bloke called Brian Grubb, and uh, he's a wakeboarder, and he's just set a record of um, going off a building in Dubai, wakeboarding off into a base jump. And it was one of the most viewed videos on Instagram ever and stuff. And I did oh, a, I saw that. Yeah, I did a couple of jumps with him in Switzerland. You know, he was a great lad, and I was going to talk to him, you know, do a bit with him. And then the last person I was going to meet was uh, that Nims. You know, I was going to meet I would meet up with him and, you know, perhaps do a walk or a skydive and then, um, you know, talk to him about a few bits and, and about old um, Waldo. You mm. know, it's like, yeah. You, you know, you were going to meet up with no, 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 Waldo? No, 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 no. This was like after his, you know, yeah, because at his gig it was like, oh, mate. Like, it was a, sh- yeah. Was Have fun. you seen what's happened to Jules Ratcliffe? You're not aware of this? Oh mate, Have yeah, you read about this? I was like, yeah, I heard, mate. I like, you know, yeah. Any any update on him? I don't know, mate. No, no, so no. For people, for people not aware, and not, uh, it's not aware what we're talking about. And this is this is public. This is public knowledge. So I'm not giving anything away. But Jules is a friend of ours. Say yes, a friend, ex colleague. Like I would, I haven't seen him for years. But um, he's also a skydiver, and he did a jump not long ago, uh, and I think under canopy collided with someone else and in the process got his leg ripped off in the air uh, and then he managed to tourniquet himself with uh, the harness that had been around obviously what was now a stump uh, he tourniqueted himself I'm led to believe with his harness to try and stem the bleeding this is while he's in the air under the canopy then managed to land but broke his femur and broke his back and something else in the process I think he's currently in, I- in an ICU um, uh, not in great condition so fingers crossed he pulls through it um, uh, yeah there's been too there's been too many people getting smashed by that sport recently hmm. it's like, and it's it, it seems to me it's like it's safer than that Yes, I don't know if it's just what you know, like um, it's just coincidence that they happen to be people that we know over the last few years. But I wouldn't want to do it, mate. But you got to no think of the people you. we know, you no know good, you. good blokes that like to push themselves. And all well, was mega. Was, well, yeah, well, yeah, super, super skilled, mate. You really, you know, on it. You know, the boy was. You couldn't have done more of apprenticeship or more of a training school to get to his level to what he's done. You know what I mean? So fair play, and and for it to go like that it was super sad. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, sorry. I will, um, so Nims. So I was going to meet with him, you know, like do a chat with him. So there were the three lads I was going to meet up during the training. Mm. You know, do a bit of a thing with them, and then the Nims, was, Nims lives down near you, does he not? I don't know. I think so. And he go on. But yeah, and then I was obviously going to do some training with cliff divers, the Red Bull cliff divers, again, and just be a bit. Yeah, I'll just try and be a bit humble to him and say like. I can't do what you're doing. I can't do what you do, but I'm doing this, you know, which is pretty cool anyway. And do a bit of training with them and, and not to overshadow what they're doing, not to overshadow them at all, not to cast a cloud. Well, I'm going higher than you. No, it's a case of, you no, know, you lot are brilliant and maybe you can help me get to this and, and do a little program like that. And I put all that together to them and uh, yeah, they just came out of a flat no. Like after, for a lot, you know, they strung me along for a bit as they do I've even been on NDAs with them and everything and they just strung me along and then just no yeah I mean I bet I bet their bar is so high when it comes to what they'll take on yeah but mate this what is, they'll invest in and what they want yeah but this is this is interesting stuff I agree you know like, and, and not done it's not done and it's uh, yeah I just think like whew you know and I've seen some of the stuff they've put out recently and I'm a bit like yeah I know they're already an established athlete Red Bull athlete with a profile and so but it's a bit lame come on you know, like, like come on like, I thought you were pioneers you're sort of like you're playing it safe at the minute mm. you know it's got to be a bit of a he who dares rodders you mm. know what I mean yeah um, have you ever have you ever thought about doing anything underwater Record wise, you're a diver, aren't you? Uh, no, no. Well, I've done a little bit, but nothing, nothing crazy. I am. Um, yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not too fussed about going underwater for records, mate. I'll um, I, I'd give it a go if it if it was good enough. But I'm more of an aerial boy. I like, I like the. In fact, what did you jump in Portsmouth? 
What did you base jump in Portsmouth? Was it Portsmouth or Southampton? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, the Spinnaker Tower. The spin jump, the Spinnaker, didn't you? Yeah. Were you, you, you? Do you want to talk about that or not? Yeah, no, no. It's, um, Were you the first person to base jump that? No, no, no. 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 I was the <laughs> I was the fifth. A couple of blokes jumped it when uh, it was going up in construction and a couple of blokes broke into it and, and caused a bit of damage and got in trouble. You know, like, well, they're in trouble. They've not been caught. Um in about 2017 so they they burnt it forever as in there's no way you're jumping it and I took the job on it <laughs> as in a, a normal a job well it was a bit of um, a bit of rope work going on and um, I had a day off and uh, you know it's all sorts of stuff but yeah I had a day off and uh, I went in on my day and I like, says alright I'm just going to grab my bits said, yeah yeah no worries and uh, I went <laughs> Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, I didn't get paid. Just, just to let people know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's an expensive jump. It was an expensive one, so just, yeah. yeah. Why, why the urge? Because it's my city. That's my place, isn't it? And mm. it's it's a great feature. And it's, that's, my, that's my town. Yeah, no, yeah, I had to get it done, yeah. You're doing loads of base jumping now, aren't you? I've seen you doing yeah. loads of stuff over the last few years. Yeah, I've done... On your Insta profile. Yeah, I've done, done quite a few. Um, Why are the fixation on few? that at the moment? Mate, it's... It seems too dangerous to me, John. Nah, it's, it's no... You don't think so? Nah. It looks dangerous as fuck. Yeah, it does, yeah, because you just see an idiot jumping off, you know, like, Wee. No, it's, mate, the amount of red slads that should be base jumping that aren't, you know, there's these rules, you know, you must have 200 skydives, you know, and the amount of marines that what are rules? everywhere. What rules? Well, look, so with, with base jumping, yeah. obviously you need an element of training before you just get a rig and jump. Uh, well, know? yeah, but ideally, but there's no regulations. No, there? there's right. none at all. Right, right, so right, you right. could get a base rig now and, and do a jump. And I bet some more have done that. And yeah, one answer. or two people have done that and they've hurt themselves and it's not good. So it's always good to have a bit of experience. But, so the, the, the rule is they say, with base jumping now, back in the day, base jumping was, you know, like it was just a few people that did it and no one really knew. And it was a case of, wow, what's this all about? Now, base jumping is skydivers now within the skydiving industry or world or whatever it's called there's loads of rules and regulations right and everyone are in these boxes you're you're a A license you're a B license you're a C you can do this you can't you can fly a camera you can't you can jump with your friends you can't you can and they're safe everyone likes to be in their box and they're safe oh I'm one of these and I'm safe right skydivers now have just dominated base jumping it's just mate you're, you're a skydiver you've got 200 jumps or you've, and then you go and do your base course and now you're base you know like you've done your base course and then all of a sudden someone's taking you to an object or a cliff or whatever and you've jumped 200 times off of that and now you're a, you're a, you've done 200 base jumps you're not a base jump you're just a skydiver that's done 200 base jumps do you know what I mean base jumping used to be a case of breaking the rules finding entries getting ways in you know getting a re- and it was all secretive and it was all it's not a so much just about the jump you know what I mean well, my mate that's taught us how to do it and stuff he's brilliant he's called Dan the Man Dan Witchells you're on a base jump he's the boy DTM base and um, this is his words like, like it's just now it's just like it's not just about the jump it's about the journey getting to the jump you know what I mean it might be an easy jump but getting to it might have been a real mission you know like what's going on and how you got there whereas now these skydivers will walk to a cliff edge and go like Switzerland Christ you go there and there's different types of base jumping, you know, and, and... What are the different types? So slider up and slider down, for example. So when you jump slider down, right? Well, it's for, okay, let's go slider up. So you've skydived, you pull your parachute, the parachute opens, and it opens softly. You've got this thing called a slider that slides down and, and it softens your opening. Now... When you do these base jumps, you can go to Switzerland or whatever, you can do these slider up jumps. So you jump, you go for, I don't know, 10 seconds full, and then you pull your parachute and... uh, Mate, you've got so much time falling through the air and there's so much to look at and all them. And then you've got loads of time, your parachute opens softer and you've got loads of time to sort any problems out and then you're... It's mountain skydiving. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's what it's referred to. Slider down... You got minimal time. You got a maximum of three seconds. You know what I mean? And then you're deploying, and you when your canopy opens, it's 
bam it's like getting rear-ended it's like whiplash like, whoa it's crazy territory so so you'd prepare a slider when you're packing your chute and what mm. that means is that the chute opens faster if the slider's already down but it's a harder strain a, on the body when it whips you around exactly that okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly that. So when it's slider up, it's a softer opening. It takes a lot longer, but it's softer opening. And you, if you were jumping low level base jumps, you got to slide it down. You slide it down. Yeah, all day long, right? So you slide it down. So it just bam, it opens. And um, yeah, so most buildings are slider down and things like that. Slider down jumps. Um, and like I was saying, yeah. So skydivers, you mate, base jumping now. It's not, it's not hard to get into. You can find someone that's, you know, the amount of people that are willing to do courses or show you how to do it and all them. And yeah, you know, as ever, you know, anything slightly adventurous, it's swarming with marines everywhere. They're uh, <laughs> they're all over it. Um, but yeah, so the reg boys, I think, I think more reg boys need to be base jumpers. You know, there's not enough because mm. obviously what makes me laugh as well is people underestimate the amount of training we have for our jumps you know the Bryce Norton and then the synthetics training for the military jumps yeah, yeah. mate yeah. you watch a skydiver civvy kick out a twist it's pitiful mate you're just watching them you're like what is he doing they're trying to grab the risers they eh, eh. mate wrench them apart kick out a twist and we, that's what we do I think that reg boys are built for base jump that's what they are mate they are and there, yeah, there needs to be more. Of them. But yeah, we're but working I, boys, aren't we? We're working boys. So yeah. it's the money to swan off and go skydiving. And then the, yeah, there is that, experience. but also I think it's jumping rounds, right? And jumping the way the rounds jumping is in the military. Yeah. I reckon rounds, that puts a lot of people, a lot of parachuting in general. It I does. don't want to go back up in a plane to jump out. Thank you well, very much. No, thank you. Yeah. Because it's mar- that scarred me. I understand. Yeah, but you jump in a canopy. I, get, can't I understand. You can't I get, steer it. I get, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, the civvy you know skydiving yeah. parachuting whatever, even the static line you know you come down you're under a square you yeah. land in nice I get it yeah. but no thanks mate the amount of civvy skydivers that have never heard of an air still how have you not heard of an air still because they don't jump so close mm. you know what I mean they're not like it mm. I'm like mate you know people say oh have you heard of anyone getting injured I was like yeah I know lads that snap legs you know Ex- Ollie, expl- Ollie White snapped his legs or Jay Davis broke his back you know what I mean like, these are- explain an air steel to people the uninitiated so when a canopy is deployed and you're underneath your canopy but yet you're close proximity to another person and and you, they're also under canopy they're under canopy also and you fly over their canopy right they are stealing all the air they have got all the air so your canopy crumbles and you crash into them you'll fall into them and you get tangled up and twisted and it's a bit of an effect air steel yeah go on google go on to youtube and google air steals you'll see it's all military jumping as john said there you'll see what you'll see is is the shoot at the person the shoot above their shoot literally closes up there's no air inflating it anymore and it just mm. closes up and they just plummet yeah plummet military jumping you are lots, on you've got lots of steals watching people yeah, under yeah. steals you got, it's scary oh, you've got lots of kit on you've got all this kit you're low level Squirrel flying Squirrel had a bad air steal didn't he did he I'm sure Squirrel did I'm sure I watched him have <laughs> a crumbling once yeah, yeah, well, yeah. it might have done yeah, yeah. I, it was good yeah um, but yeah so you've got all this kit you're low level flying you're jumping you, the winds are horrendous it's pitch black you don't know that these edges 600 foot you know you jump it you're all next to each other you're under a canopy you can't steer you can't see the, the ground coming up you're falling 20 foot a second bang you're in the ground and people wonder why we don't want to jump you know it's not yeah civilian jumping is a different world and base jumping mate yeah it's yeah question for you Go. I've got a friend who's civvy a skydiver uh, he wants to he wants to jump into Arnhem mm. um, now he's been told he can't do it because he hasn't got his rounds li- he wants to jump in for the anniversary he hasn't mm. got his rounds licence but you can get yeah. your rounds licence as a civvy can't yeah, you yeah of course you, you can, can get it in short order you, who you, can I put him in touch with uh, I don't know the name oh, well, I know it, yeah Hippo knows him Dale Wild he knows uh, Tom Blakey you're thinking of uh, no, Hippo, Dale Wild knows, he knows people to get in touch with and all that. For, yeah, I for think Dale job. will say Tom Blake. Oh, right? okay, yeah. All right. Yeah, we've already tried that, haven't you? Anyway. Oh, okay. But anyway, yeah, but they, they can pay within a day or so or two days training, whatever. They, they're round training, they go, they're away. Mm, I'll let him know. I'll yeah. Him know. Um, what was your first base jump? Oh, well, I did a course. 
So I met up with uh, Dan Witchells, Dan the Man, DTM bass. I've plugged in twice there. Look. Um, and he did a documentary years ago. It was called The Men That Jump Off Buildings and uh, on YouTube. And it was a great, you know, like cutting edge Channel he 4 it, thing. He? he was, he's, a, yeah. So he's, he's a the British ma- guy. Yeah, he's the main character in that documentary. He's an Essex boy. He really, mate, he's a funny bloke. Where in Essex is he? Uh, well, he's not in. He's not there anymore. He's oh. down West Country. Okay. But um, so you meet up with him, and uh, he, t- you know, he teaches you how to pack and meets you and all that sort of stuff. And you go out to France, south of France. There's normally, you know, there's maximum of three here, and um, you learn to jump. He, t- he takes you to the. There's a mecca of base jumping down there for for large bridges and stuff like that. Bridges is the safest option to learn, and there's different methods of base jumping. So like your first one, he pulls the. the canopy out for you it's called a PCA pilot shoot assist and it, you develop from there then you do handheld throws and then stow jumps and you jump different objects and he gives you within that week he teaches you you know confidently how to pack and how to you know navigate the weather and what to jump how to jump and all this sort of stuff and it's a bloody good course it's really good fun yeah so uh, he's he's the bloke to uh, he, he, the reason I like him is because you've got lots of youngsters coming through or, or you know I'm talking like a sweat I'm not a sweat of the sport at all um, but you get lots of younger people doing it and they might have a couple of years of jumping or whatever but this fella's been jumping 20 plus years and he's still here you know, he's still around. He's you know never injured or things like that, and that's a good reputation to have within base jumping. So, um, so yeah. Whereas there's there's other people that might have had, you know, near misses or, or whatever, whatever. But but yeah. So he's he, to me for Britain, he's he's the bloke I would look to. There's obviously other other people from other countries that are great, and you know there are there are very good people out there. But he, he he's top boy, I would say. Mm. Mm. Interesting, yeah. And it was, so, yeah, he took so us to France, France. And yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I think we did about fifteen jumps or something, different objects and that sort of stuff. So yeah, went down there, learnt down there, and then yeah, came back. What was your you first know? jump after you did your training? Though uh, I came back. My first jump, I so I came back. And I did a building in Southampton. Um, I came back from my jumps. Did, did a building in Southampton, and then. It was literally I was straight on the spinnaker, <laughs> so yeah. So, One yeah. jump and then the spinnaker. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was yeah. So, so a, a lot of people found it very funny because yeah, um, it's just the opportunity arose and, and that was me. I was straight on it. What's your process? Watch what you've selected. Where you're going to jump? You've wrecked it, right? Yeah. And then it's I don't know. It's it's. 10, 15 minutes before you're going to jump, five minutes, 30 seconds. What's your process leading to that jump? From so the, from the practical preparation yeah. and also mental aspect. So you get, you get you find an object, you know, yeah, that's high enough. First things first, it's high enough. How high? Well, what's, what's high is high okay, enough. Okay, here's, here's one, right? I've got a building where I, near me. Um, I got a few as well, yeah. Yeah, so so it's it's around two hundred foot, yeah, lovely access, yeah, okay, good, yeah. Landing area, good, yeah. Weather. Need a good weather window, okay, so waiting for that. Rig packed, how am I gonna jump? Is it gonna be a static line? Is it gonna be a handheld, free fall, whatever? Decided, okay, good. Um, how would you decide that? Height. Height and landing area. So if it's really low, you know, you know, um, yeah, if it's really low, it's different on how you jump, you know, whether it's handheld, stowed, or, or PCA to stay line. Um, and yeah, so so I found that, okay, brilliant. And then, yeah, it'll be a case of, right, we're going for it on this time, this date, get in, and then it's the buzz of breaking in, you know, your Ocean's 13, aren't you? Ocean's 11, whatever, come on, breaking in and going for it. And then you're at the top, little gear check, compose yourself, be calm, area wins yeah good who you with check each other out if you know if, or if you're on your own and then yeah it's just go for it but it's just the escapism of it all mate you get like, fear before you jump um f- loads of fear from the whole like talking about it even now it's a bit Wah, it's coming you know like but um but yeah before you jump so I've sometimes sometimes it's a bit like mm, you know that wasn't that that bad and other times it's a case of fuck I am so scared this is so how do you when you're in that situation and you're extreme fear yeah how what do you do to manage it I talk to myself in the sense of what have I done so there's my equipment 
I've packed it the same. I've checked it the same. That's my gear. I trust my gear. That's my equipment. Yep, yeah, this is all good. The weather's good. Yep, yeah, this is good. The jump's good. The landing or whatever, whatever. Yep, yeah, this is all good. And it's a process of this is it. I'm totally ready. You know, no matter what happens now, I'm ready. I want to be here. I'm going. And it, if it's a case of I don't want to be here, I don't want to do this, pff, I turn around, turn around, get down. You know, don't do it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it's that really. It's knowing I'm in full control the whole time. I'm in full control. Yeah. Is it dangerous to jump if you haven't got control of that fear? Oh, of course, mate. I've been with lads, right? Right. I see one, and the lights are on, and no one's home. They are just, <gasps> and yeah, I don't want to be around that. Or panicking. Yeah. Just yeah, mate. Like, you know, don't get me wrong. Some people get frightened. You know, they'll count three. To, oh, and they'll have to do their count again or something you know that's that's a standard you know that's all right that's all good but when I'm looking at you now I'm and we're talking about going over the edge we're going we're jumping out of the winds how's your kit this and you're just blankly looking at me just I just want to jump uh, yeah I don't want to be with you no why not because, mate when people are scared right they make bad decisions right here we go 10 80 10 Right, they're your facts, right? So, 10% of people in an emergency situation, right, they will stay calm, relax, you know, be relaxed, composed, and they will make the correct decisions. They will be okay, right? 80% of people, they might freeze, they might panic, they might get tunnel vision, they might just not know what's going on, but they can snap out of it, right? And with a bit of training and life experience and stuff, you can train yourself to become quicker and you can get out of that more and more. And that's 80% of people. Right? And we learn that sort of stuff through judgmental training, experiences, things like that. The last 10% of people make the wrong decisions, run the wrong way, say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. Don't be a part of them. Get away from them. Don't want to know you. No. Mate, I don't want to jump with you and something happened and goes wrong and... What? I'm going to have to deal with that I'm going to have to witness all of this aren't I and and be the aftermath I don't want to be with that I like to be with good people that you know know their stuff you know they're not just here to try and get the grand picture they're here for the jump you know they're here to love it yeah you want people you want to be around people who are cognitively aware switched on yeah. and not being know they know what's going by, on um, thoughts yeah. there was a young lad recently and it was so sad to watch. It was so... He was only, you know, early 20s or mid-20s, whatever. And he was just a young lad who liked base jumping and, yeah, it's a bit mental and, re, you know, it's great and things like that, right? And, and that's fair, fair, you know, lots of people, yeah, it's great. And he's in Thailand, right? And he's put his rig on, right? He's put his rig on and his bridle... Right, so the bridle, so you pitch, right? You pull out your pilot shoots, the little one, and that's attached to a big old bit of web in textile. It's called your bridle. That goes to your pins, pop, pop, out comes your canopy, right? That's how it works. Super simple. His bridle is rerouted, like incorrectly rooted. So instead of being free and being able to get to his pins, pop, pop, he's put his rig on and he's got his bridle through his leg strap. Oh, so he's oh. got it on. And How the fuck did you manage that? Mate, you're, you're buzzing. You're in a building. You're in Thailand. You're, you're about to jump off a 200-foot building or whatever. You know, y- 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 everything's in the air, isn't it? Well, you I know, mean? but that's, yeah, you think yeah, about the checks we have. But, mate, we, go through we the do have checks. So yes, yeah. Bang, bang, but, bang, bang, yeah, bang. Check everything. But, mate, what are we? We're all human. What do we do? Mm. We all make mistakes. You might have had a bad day. You might have not had your coffee. You might not have slept. You know, your dog might have been moaning at you. Do you know what I mean? You don't know, do you? You don't know what's going on. So you can't judge these people, especially when they've paid the ultimate price. You can't judge them. Um, oh, did he spank in? Mate, yeah, he jumped. So he was all set to jump. And his bridle was rooted through his leg strap. This was, I don't know, must have been about four months ago, five months ago, something like so that. So he jumped, tr- deployed the pilot shoot. He jumped, pilot, shoot didn't do pilot shoots come out. Or it was a static line, so it was going to be pulled oh. out. And the canopy didn't come out because of the... Oh, because God. of the re- Yeah, it's tragic, mate. And that poor kid, you know, like, he's got to... And his video footage of it all and all that. Oh, God. It leaked out straight away. And I just think, oh, his poor family, you know, like... Yeah, so, you know, there is, you know, obviously it's sad and all them, there, it is sad, but, you know, and hindsight is a wonderful thing, 
but obviously it's the training that we get and the processes that we do and stuff like that so yeah mm. and and you can't talk ill of him because you know he's, he made a mistake and he's paid the price when we were talking on the icebreaker you mentioned about um, like using breathing to control fear and stuff like that and yeah. I, I didn't realise like I knew so up until a few years ago I knew I knew how effective breathing methods could be to change your state of mind yeah but I hadn't realised how quickly they could be how quickly could impact you so when I was I was cold showering for a bit yeah. uh, like I don't know maybe four or five months till it got to winter and I was like fuck that. <laughs> I wasn't even outside inside yeah. the water temperature changed I was like oh my god and um, and then I really learned cold but I would get into the shower right and I and the reason I was doing it was just it was it was for um, I was giving myself hardship adversity and a sense of achievement yeah. like each day yeah. at that time I, I was not in a great place and um I would get in the shower and I'd put the shower on the cold and I'd, I'd stand and my shower's in the bath right? yeah. and I'd, be, I'd just be stood there looking at the shower man, uh-huh. going fuck fuck and I'd be going yeah. fuck 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 yeah. in my head yeah. fuck 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 yeah. fuck and then it would take me such a build up to get in to just like god just get in there yeah. and I'd get in there and, be fine. and then uh, I read something about a really simple technique um, uh, one was to it was one quick like two couple of seconds technique to get your adrenaline pumping to elevate your sense of urgency and your set your, your excitement and all that towards something and the other and in the reverse it was to calm yourself and it was two quick breaths in through your nose but trying to fill your lungs as, as much as you can and then slow out and you do that twice or three times you're like yeah that just yeah. that right yeah. I started doing that in the shower I would do that and it would immediately calm me it worked immediately calm me and I would just walk in but how long did that take me to do that then it took me seconds yeah and it's like tricking your body yeah. tricking your body into thinking it's in a particular state environmentally and then relaxing huh. and the other one one is um, with anxiety so a really good way to reduce anxiety is to eat something right or because your body when you eat something it tr- it tr- triggers the body into ah we need to activate the digestive process but when you're in an anxious state you're getting close to fight or flight you yeah. know like surviving for your life this is sort of the early part of the scale of that so when you're in an anxious state your body is reducing the blood flow to all of your your like your your um your your in the digestive system and stuff like right. this and it's increasing the blood flow to survive right now we need to run motherfucker places brain heart and all that so when you eat if you're in an anxious state when you eat it triggers the body into reallocating blood flow and attention to your digestive system which draws it away from the fight or flight yeah as uh, um uh a mental state mm. But you don't also you don't have to eat. You can go through the act of eating. So if you are really anxious, <clears throat> people try this. If you have someone who gets anxious in certain situations, if you chew, it can be chewing gum or it can be nothing at all. Go through the motion of chewing, literally like you know just chewing, <laughs> chewing as if it's just chewing thin air. Your body thinks it's about to start processing food and it can lower your anxiety levels. Again, really quick, really simple, really easy to do. Don't even need to buy, don't even need to buy, even need to buy a scarf or get yeah. out of the fridge, you know. It's am- the, the way the body is amazing, it's such a simple thing that I think many people don't realize. And I think they don't realize because they're not, they're not in really fearful situations often enough mm. to have to pay attention to these things. And that's another thing that I really enjoy about that is exactly what you said, the fearful situation. Mate, when you nearly die, that's when you're most alive. You know what I mean? At the points where you you're in your most vulnerable state, you're nervous, you're scared, you think you know you could possibly nearly die. You, mate, when you nearly do, like like you feel like oh I'm nearly, you don't want your bowels, mate. You you not you'll never be constipated. You know yeah. that that worry that you got about your car or, or whatever, whatever, it's gone. Everything is gone, and that feeling, that drug. Do you know what I mean? That's just so addictive. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. So just being in that state all the time, you just you look over the edge. You think, 
this could be it this could be it you know like, you, don't, you don't know what could happen this could be it and that feeling mate it's just such a powerful thing you know and that drug it's just mate yeah natural drugs mate it's just it's the heroin of natural drugs it's brilliant yeah <clears throat> It's not good to exist in that state all the time. Though. Not all the time, no. No, well, look at me now. I'm fine, aren't I? <laughs> but the weekend, when the weather's good... Yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing at the weekend? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> one or two might get done in, but yeah, like... But that's it, you know, it's... um, Yeah, and then you're away, you're just calm, you're at peace, you know, it's... Mm. What's next on the hit list, then? Big, big thing. I mean, Rebel used to turn you down. Yeah. But... So how do you uh, readjust your sights for that one? Well, I just, thing? you know, it's, if someone likes the idea, they might they might talk to us, you know, put, put a few things out, you know, people might like it. Um, I've been, I have been busy with work. See, when, when work kicks off, I just, it's feast or famine, you know, you've got to go for it. You've got to do the work. And, and so the work, I've been been doing a lot of film so I did a lot of television before like adventure travel and things like that oh you did Star Wars last year yeah, yeah. But I've been I've been so so I, d- I did a Marvels um, one and then I got put put on the Star Wars one so what are you doing on them uh, stunt I'm, st- I'm, a, I'm a stunt rigger so yeah I'm, I'm in the stunts with the stunts doing the doing the rigging you know making people and things fly so when a Jedi goes or, or whatever and you fly that's I'll be making you go <laughs> that sort of fun stuff yeah it's yeah it's been bloody good and I've just come off a gig um, in Belfast I was out there I was on the, the it's, well I can't, I can't really talk too much about it but it's the, it's the new How to Train Your Dragon film okay. yeah the motion picture so yeah mm, that's a that's a new one coming out I was on that yeah that's pretty cool so yeah I don't what's in the future I don't know I just wait for the phone to ring really yeah, got to keep your hobbies going, mate. Just got to keep it safe. I love the downtime. So work is just so, mate. You you, when work's going, there's you got no life. You are literally just work, 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 and it's so varied and and whatever. And you need to be on it because if you, I don't know, you you put a, put an eye in the end of a rope wrong, you know that could drop a camera drop a person drop an object or whatever you know that could kill people you know you have to be on it all the time you're just on it on it on it so when work's not happening it's just mate yeah there's been some high profile over the years stunts gone wrong with major actors isn't there didn't uh, Bruce Lee's son die from a stunt gone wrong in Uh, The Crow yeah he got shot didn't he oh was he shot did he get shot yeah I think he got shot yeah Um, Brandon 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 Lee Lee, yeah mate that was I have them recently. They're donkeys. That was like twenty odd years ago. I oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 20, just exactly. Yeah, well, you, yeah. well, I mean, on the gunshot, where you got, you got what's his name, Alec Baldwin, got in the court in a minute. Right. And, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. That's all. Yeah, it's all crazy, mate. The the it's the world now though, it's not it's not as it was. There's a lot more health and safety involved, and, and with the people within the industry well especially well I can't say for most but I've worked to, you know closely with other departments like your special effects and, and all them but but within the stunts mate they're so I can't say other than professional they're, they're professional in the sense of you know the boys are at the top of their game you know so, so it, what I've found with my experience is that people are they're at the top top of their field and they've been bought in you might be doing a standard bloke job or whatever but you are the top of that that area that you do you know like you are you're well up there and you know your onions sort of thing you know so yeah that's that's. I've worked with some really good people um, on the subject of stunts yeah. is it is it called is it have you heard of the British stunt school the British stunt film? register no, not the register. British Stunt Register? No, or Academy. The British Stunt Academy, I think it might be called. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the guy who runs that, and I forget his name, he's got, I'm sure he's got a Greek-sounding name. I met that guy on the set of Slow Horses, and he... You talk about Star Wars, what reminded me. Mm. And he's ex reg block. Oh. So when we were talking, we were just discussed, just chatting about stuff, and he asked if I was ex-military. I said, yeah, blah, 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 reg, reg. Oh, fucking hell, you're reg. And he was... Um, he did... He was the stunt double for Ewan McGregor 
Oh, was it Ewan McGregor? Yeah, in The Force Awakens. You know, the, the, the episode one of Star Wars, the, oh, yeah. the, the first of the remakes. Yeah. He, I'm sure he was a stunt double for, Anna, for for McGregor in that. And or he did the choreography for the fight scenes because he's a, he's a martial artist ninja dude. What's his name? Well, I know you're going to ask me that. I'll have to have a look. <laughs> I'm sure his company is the British Stunt Academy. Yeah. Uh, he was supplying the stunt the stunt men for slow horses at the time. Yeah. That's why he was on set. Uh, British Stunt... I'm just Googling folks. Yeah. Saying, British Stunt Academy. British Stunt School, British Stunt Academy. Mate, I've not met British that Action, many... British Action Academies might be, actually. Yeah, I've not met many Reds lads, um, really. British... Here we go. Brit, I'm sure this is it. British Action Academy. Blah 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 blah, and oh, that oh, he's had his haircut. Um, yeah, uh, his name is Andreas Petridis. Petride, I'm sure it's him. Blah 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 blah. He's ex-reg, is he? Yeah, he's ex-reg, mate. Wow. Sure, that's him. Um, one second, read more. I just want to check. I'm not talking rubbish here. <laughs> uh, on a Walt uh, Mitty hunt here. You, you listeners, you, you right there, we'll, we'll get up. Yeah, here we go. Andreas was the second unit stunt coordinator, fighter ranger, and stunt double to Ewan McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, The Phantom Menace, sorry, The Phantom yeah. Menace in 1999. Um, yeah, he's X2 power. Oh, nice. He's not on that bio there, but he's X2 no. power, yeah. We're worth, yeah no. Reach out to him, mate. We're worth a good little yeah, connection there. Eh? There's a, there's the a, British Action Academy is the British company. Action Academy, eh? Mm. Yeah, no, I, I'm not, not cross paths with him, no. Mm. I have to get him in, maybe. I have to get him in, yeah. Oh, he sounds an interesting lad, yeah. Yeah, it's not as interesting as you, John. I, I, I was nicknamed interesting bloke. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what have we not covered that you want to cover? Um, it was good to hear about Ukraine. It was good to hear about that. And Vans Without Borders. You know, I have my reservations about the conflict and now we're supporting it however the fact of the matter is there are people there who do not want to be there they exactly. need support they are totally fucked mm. and um, and uh, you know organisations like Vans Without Borders yeah. of which you are a founding member I did not realise uh, are super important yeah yeah no nice one yeah that's nice to hear and, it's, and you're right yeah people that don't want to be there mm. Mm. anything else you want to talk about um, I did a world record for them. For who? Bands Without Borders. What do you mean you did a world record for I them? Did the, you said what, it so flippantly. I did a world's <laughs> lowest parachute jump. Oh, really? Yeah. Go on, go on. Yeah, it was uh, out of a cherry picker. It was, um, yeah. Um, in Ukraine? No, in in England. Uh, just, just outside Portsmouth, yeah. yeah. A, a cherry picker. I did a 85 foot. How many metres is that? Uh, 26. Jesus Christ. Yeah. That yeah. must have been... One second, don't tell me. Pilot shoot assisted. You know it. Get in there! Yeah. PCA. PCA, yeah. Yeah, I'll... Uh, the, Static line? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Dan the man pulled it out as I jumped. So, yeah, he pulled it as I jumped. And, uh, yeah, I reckon I can go lower. I reckon I could knock about eight foot off really right. yeah how hard did you hit the ground that jump though ah mate nothing on nothing on our landings mate oh really still no, nah nothing nothing like the I British jumping nope no way the British military jumping no say. I'm telling you no fucking hell yeah yeah interesting <laughs> yeah and we used to do that routinely yeah I know 16 feet a second like we did at the ground 20 is it 20 feet 20 a second 20 second yeah right Oh, yeah. so I also don't miss that bit. Injuries. <laughs> That's, that would be so. When I was when I'd be in the plane, I'd, I've got a fear of heights, right? I think anyone with a sense of with a, a normal brain has got a fear of heights, just about how you let it control you or not. Um, and I didn't like the thought of jumping out the plane. But I used to do what you were talking through earlier. I would rationalise. Okay, how often do these shoots fail to open? Like never. Yeah. How often do people get injured doing this? Well, a lot when they land. So. I would overcome the fear and the last few jumps I actually did I ended up enjoying going out I yeah. enjoyed completely flipped it over because of that rationalisation I thought chill the fuck out nothing else just go out and enjoy it apart from the landing yeah apart from the landing because the, the, the chance of injury is so high I used to have love you seen it. so many people injured yeah you know? but I loved the jumping I loved it I always loved it I thought it was great and obviously we never had YouTube and and all that um, so just 
when you would hear your full screws in depot talking about jumping and all that mate mm. you would just dream and then you know like you yeah. would just think about the aircraft I'd never been on an aeroplane with the door open do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, they open yeah. the door and you just... Yeah. It's yeah. amazing. And then you've got to stand in yeah. the door waiting to jump Mate, for a couple of minutes looking am- out. Yeah, how amazing was it? And then you jump yeah. up. You can just go on YouTube and watch it or TikTok and watch all it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think it was like... Everything was literally a, a genuinely brand new experience, yeah, wasn't it? You it had was. no idea about it. Yeah. Mate, you didn't know about the Trinasium. You marched past it about two times or three times. You didn't know what it was like. You know what I mean, you didn't know nothing, did you? Mm. And yeah, I remember I had a little disposable camera on my fourth jump, and I literally just like popped a little disposable picture, boop, like uh, on my fourth jump. I loved it. You know, yeah, I loved jumping. Yeah, <laughs> I did like it. <laughs> yeah, cool, mate. It's been a pleasure. How can people follow what you're doing? Um, at John the Flying Fish on the gram. At John the Fly. Are you only on the gram. Nothing else. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I know am I that nonsense um, My Instagram's just as bad though. Instagram yeah mm. I'm on the gram right. at John the Flying Fish at John the Flying Fish Woo. sweet well um, what was the next one you doing um, hang on I've got a joke for you oh god yeah I phoned TripAdvisor they just told me to walk around with my shoes untied no no good do you forget every time you call me man, it starts off with some nonsense joke <laughs> fucking hell that's a good one that was a great one amazing and on that note on that cheery note and that incredible incredible joke did you make that up yourself no well, see I'd be more impressed if you read it up yourself well I'd be impressed I'm not creative enough you'll find a way it's been a pleasure mate yeah it is thanks for coming out oh we need to introduce you to bags we'll do yeah nice